Hello, what's live stream? We're going to talk about and think about and maybe even look up info keywords, informational keywords, non-buyer type keywords. And this has been a more and more popular topic as the, I guess the year has gone on, as the days go by. There are a lot of case studies. There's a lot of stories out there where people are moving away from solely relying on affiliate ads and not ads, but affiliate links and affiliate revenue. And they're looking at ad revenue. And the other, you know, there's a few reasons for it, but one of the other interesting pieces is a lot of people are going for these informational keywords. And we've been hearing, I've talked to a lot of people that they found essentially like unlimited informational keywords where there's a chance they're never going to be able to get to all the keywords that they found. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Please do ask questions in the chat if you're watching the replay later. Thank you very much. You can ask questions in the comments. I do try to hop in and answer some of those or uh, basically interact via the comments. However, I kind of I, I'm not that great at it. So what happens is like a week goes by, I don't say anything, and then I'll go and do a bunch of them. So one quick note for the live people here: let me know in the chat if you could hear me. We have Daniel on, we have Zach, we got David, we have Gaz, a lot of the usual folks here. And thanks a lot for hopping on. Like I said, if you do have questions, you can ask in the chat. You can ask in the comments and we'll get around to it. If you are compelled, you can like the video as well. I've liked it myself over here. If you can't like your own video, you know, who will? All right, we have body language matters. Uh, first question, how do you find the keywords? So yeah, we'll, we'll look at a couple different areas here. And the good part is honestly, there's no like wrong way to do this. You talk to a bunch of different people and you'll get a bunch of different answers. Quick example, if you haven't checked out the video that I published yesterday with Marty McLeod, definitely check it out. He is starting a new site and he's actually, you know, doing this low competition, informational only keywords. And it's early on. The cool thing is, he hasn't, uh, like the, the site hasn't started earning a lot of money yet. Although I think in the comments, he actually said things have started to take off here in the last few weeks. The, the, uh, kind of interesting thing is you can talk to someone like Marty and he has one technique and then you talk to someone else and they're like, I don't use keyword research tools. I just go and search for, uh, topics in Reddit or something like that which is something that you can't actually do. So we'll go through a couple different, um, I guess, ways to do it. We'll look at like one tool, KW Finder, just because it's the one I use for keyword research generally. And there's, you know, tons of other tools out there. It really doesn't matter. And I'm not one of the people that is a strong proponent of any one tool. I use KW Finder um, just because it's sort of oriented around just keyword research. There are other tools under the man ghouls umbrella, but KW Finder, I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that was their first tool and then they've added other stuff later. So that said, you can use any tool you want. You can not use any tools at all if you don't want to and go from there. Now, before we get into it too much, and I see we have a lot of people in here and body language matters, I will get to your question. I'm gonna wait until a couple more people hop on. We have Ned TV, what's up? And Ruby, how's it going? Good to see you. We have Sam as well, Atik. We have Bill and we have Gustavo. What's up, Gustavo? Good to hear from you. All right, so before we get into it, quick note, I got to give a shout out to number one, the email list. You can sign up to get email notifications for when I'm going live. There's a link in the description. Sometimes YouTube is a little unreliable. Sometimes the emails or notifications come out late. So if you want to get an email about an hour before I start these, you could sign up here. The, those emails are short, by the way. 
However, you would sign up for my full email list and some of those are long. So you just got to you know, check that out. There is a couple sponsors definitely want to check out uh, Otis Global. So we'll get a quick spot from them shortly. We have Niche Website Builders. They sponsor the Q&A and all the questions that I answer here. And I'm doing a case study with them. So there's going to be more and more content coming out around the case study. They can publish content for you. They could do link building. I had great success with a shotgun skyscraper campaign with them, which quick note, the shotgun skyscraper campaign is how I took a brand new site from a domain rating of zero up to about 48 or 49. Right now it's in the like 50 to 55 range. I can't quite remember, but it was a shotgun skyscraper campaign. And the thing is they're raising the price on that. So there's just a few days left where you could take advantage of the original pricing or the current pricing. And you're, I, th I believe you're grandfathered in, but check the details. You can save 10% using my coupon code. You can also uh, get 10% additional content. So just follow the link there. And thank you to Ezoic, the product Leap. Help your website load faster, get green and core web vitals. So thanks to Ezoic. And even if you're not going to buy anything from the sponsors, let them know that you appreciate the sponsorship for the show. Even if you've told them before, tell them again. It's good for them to hear. And I know, honestly, it's it's uh, difficult to get people to go and shoot the email or ping them on social media or whatever. But if you do it, it does help. And I definitely appreciate it. And then ATIC also asks about uh, some keywords, about methods to find uh, related subheadings. And we also have Sam from Toronto is on here. So quick uh, little definition here. The informational keywords are non-buyers keywords, non-product related. And one of the reasons why people are gravitating towards the informational keywords, there's two main ones, there's probably some other areas, but number one, a lot of times the informational keywords are a little bit easier to rank. There's a little bit less competition. And the reason why is they're not directly re like related to making a purchase, which means their value from a ad perspective is a little bit lower. Their value from a traffic perspective is probably a little bit lower. So there are less people competing for those keywords because they are inherently sort of less profitable. But that doesn't matter as much. One reason is there's so many of these informational keywords. And as we go through this, you'll start to understand why. But when you have less competition, you could start a site, publish a lot of informational content, and then you potentially are ranking sooner, getting more traffic and earning money a little bit sooner. Now, just because you have informational content on your site, it doesn't mean you can't publish product related reviews in the future. And back in the day, some sites would only have product related content, no informational content at all, like 100%. And for at least, I think, six or so years, I've been saying, do 50-50. That's going to be a pretty good ratio. I still think that stands. I think 50-50 is still something that you can work with. If you have more informational content, there's a chance you could rank a little bit more quickly. Again, lower competition. And then this gets us into the other area. If you have more informational content, there's a, a good chance you're potentially, I have no data behind this, but potentially you'll be a little bit safer from Google updates that are targeting product review websites and product reviews specifically. Over the past 12 to 18 months, so I guess it's coming up on maybe two years, there have been product review updates that Google has rolled out. They're not core major updates, but they're significant in the space for product reviews. So it has impacted a lot of people over time. And like Google does, um, it's, very, it's very interesting. Our community has varying views on what Google tells us. 
So some people are, you know, really scared about, we'll say link building, for example. They're like, I'm never going to build any links because Google tells us not to do that. And they are very, you know, dogmatic about not building links. There's also people that are on the opposite side who say, ah, you know, I see it's working. There's all these sites that are ranking by building backlinks. So Google's telling us one thing, but they're not really enforcing it in a way that is, you know, number one, it's not transparent, but number two, it's like, it seems inconsistent. So when these product review updates come out, there's a scare. And this is kind of, I believe, you know, part of the strategy that Google has is impact a handful of sites. You know, they're trying, I, I imagine they're trying to do their best, right? It's really tough. I mean, it's like a cat and mouse game. But my my hunch is part of the strategy is to create some uncertainty and some fear around certain guidelines to help influence the greater community without actually having to implement anything that actually does what they say is going to happen. So that's all a lot of speculation. But overall, the main point is if you have more informational content, there's a chance you're going to be a little bit safer from those updates that are targeting product reviews. Quick note, I do have a podcast and very soon I actually have it up on my Trello board. I'm going to be doing an episode on the March Google product review update. So on my Trello board, that's what I've called it. May change it up, but it'll be coming out soon. It'll be podcast only. So be sure you subscribe to the podcast. And there are literally hundreds of episodes for the podcast. You're sure to find something uh, interesting. And I cover stuff that's different than what's on YouTube. A lot of times are a little more in depth. There's some overlap for sure, but a lot of it is definitely unique for just the podcast. And I will talk about that product review update from March, go over some broad overviews. Okay. So the first question that we had as we scroll back up, Body Language Matters says, how do you find the keywords? So there's a lot of different approaches. And part of this is tied into like your niche selection and your brainstorming and what your site is going to be about. So there's two areas and people let me know in the chat. Let me know in the comments as well. Are you at a spot where you're trying to figure out keywords so that you could select a niche and figure out what you're going to call your domain and build your website about? Or do you have a site already? You have a niche identified and now you need to find keywords or you need to find more keywords now that you've launched your site, for example. So there's at least a couple different scenarios. So do let me know in the chat. And you know, if people want to, you can tell me a, I guess, volunteer, a niche or niche area. And I won't necessarily select it, but you know, if we have several listed here, it's a good way just to, you know, do this on the fly. Also lazy. I didn't prepare. <laughs> I, I have a couple ideas that we can go from. So number one, are you looking for a niche or not? Generally, it's good to do some kind of keyword research ahead of time before you choose your niche. You don't have to find like all the keywords you're ever going to need. You don't even need to find all the ones you need in the first year. You just need a handful. I would say if you could find like 15 to 20 keywords, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. If you could find 15 to 20 without super in-depth research, you're probably going to be able to find quite a few more, especially if you start digging in, start doing some competition analysis and that sort of thing. So one, one thing we could start on is just sort of the simple, the simple stuff no tool other than Google. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And that hopefully worked. And I hope you could see my screen. So I have a Border Collie. Her name is Georgie. She recently made an appearance in one of the videos. And I encourage you to check it out. <laughs> you could find it on the video page. And again, feel free to ask 
questions in the chat and we'll we'll get around to it. So let's say I'm interested in border collies because I have one, which is true. I am interested. And you could just type in border collies into Google. And this is just auto suggest. And it's telling us some different keywords that are potentially interesting, right? So border collies for sale, adoption. A lot of these are around, you know, acquiring a dog adoption and puppies and that sort of thing. So that's not really what we're looking for, but let's just see what Google tells us here. Some fine looking dogs there. So we have the AKC. People also ask. And dog time, border collie breed information. There's pictures. There's the Wikipedia information, videos, vet street. So there's, you know, a lot of information, very basic because we've just used like the specific term here, all right? The the main sort of high level term. But what do we see here right off the bat? I know some of people already identified this. It's this people also ask section. So we started, we didn't know shit, all right? We didn't know anything. We just know we like dogs. We know we like a specific breed. And quick note, all right? I just did an interview with a guy named Jake. His podcast episode is coming out next week. It's next Monday. And he has a site on a specific breed of dog. It's worth about $200,000. It's about 18 months old or so. Or is that right? Now, he's been earning 5K a month for about 18 months, and I think the site may be two and a half years old. So he's been doing it for a little while, but it's on a specific dog breed. And here, I'm going to spoil a little bit of the interview, but I really want you to check it out. It is so crazy. The first year, he only published 12 articles, about one per month. And by the end of the year he was making about $1,000 per month with just the 12 articles. Now, he did focus a lot on certain kinds of keywords, which I won't spoil too much. But the thing is, it was a specific dog breed, and he didn't publish a shitload of content. He just published a handful of things. Very high quality. He's a gifted writer. But anyway, okay. Back to the point. We started at Border Collies. We have people also ask, this is a fine place to get started. These are keywords right here. So people also ask, are Border Collies a good family dog? Are they well behaved? Why are Border Collies so smart? And by the way, when I first got a Border Collie, which was uh, many years ago, I, I was like, I want a smart dog. And Border Collies are usually called the smartest dog. And that's why that's why I wanted one. They're, they're very cool dogs. They're a little crazy, a little neurotic. And there's all these questions. And you're also noticing the more of these that you click on and expand, the more that show up. So all of a sudden here, we have about, I would say, 15 keywords that are all legitimate. Google is telling us specifically that people are searching for these. Now, some of these are probably a little bit redundant. You will run into that, especially as you keep expanding. Some of them are going to be less specific. So now, you know, we see border collies, uh, are they high maintenance? And then we see, you know, what's the nicest dog? And now it's just unrelated to border collies, but generally about dogs. So at some point they become a little too generalized or they don't apply for what you're looking for. However, this is a great place to start. Again, we have about 15 keywords. Generally, these are all informational. These are all question-based. We've used zero tools. We know people are searching for it. We have an answer also. We can see that we could click here and do more research if we want to. 
So this, this is perfect. Now, another thing you can do, why are border collies so smart? So we have the answer here, but there's also a, a little quick link here. Search for why are border collies so smart? So I'm gonna open that up in a new tab right here. And then we're diving in a little bit more into this specific post. So it's a insurance company, pet insurance, I suspect. And then we have other people also ask questions. They're all, you know, really close to the same kind of idea. And you may find some others that are usable on your website. So really the first couple here are border collies really smart. Are they smart or dumb? Those are, you know, pretty much redundant. We won't really be able to use that again. Now, are border collies the smartest dog in the world? That's, a, you know, a little bit different. And which is smarter, a pig or a border collie? What's the smartest dog ever? Who is the number one dog in the world? All right, so we can see some of these are kind of related, but not re completely redundant. And this gets into the area that ATIC was asking about here. So ATIC says, is there a method to find out related subheadings? So this is a way to do it. Under the main umbrella of why border collies are so smart, you can have a, you know, a general section and then you could have multiple questions underneath it that you get from each one of these sub questions. So we just did it with why are border collies so smart, but you could also go through and how smart are border collies IQ. And like you can dive in and do multiple layers of this. So I think you can see the value that, you know, at some point, Number one, you're going to end up in a spot where you're just like, you know, recursively going deeper and deeper, and then you hit the bottom, right? But you should be able to get at least a handful of questions. Now, if we zoom back out here, we go to this section here, just border collies, we have other areas to dive into. So we looked at why are they so smart, but what about the shedding aspect? Does a border collie shed? As a Border Collie owner, I could tell you, yes, they do. I literally meant to sweep this morning because there's, you know, hair on the floor. Now, Georgie's a good dog, but she does shed. We don't have to give her a bath that often, though. It's kind of cool. She just has, like, very um, clean hair. She's a good girl, like I said. So, again, you could, you could dive into this and just recursively go through here. Does a border collie shed? How do I get my border collie to stop shedding? Again, some are redundant, but you get the idea. So this is a fine way to start. And as I mentioned before, this is not using any tool. This is just going through auto suggest. We didn't look at search volume. You know, there's some people, again, some folks are really dogmatic. I am not. You can use a tool, you can not use a tool, you can look at search volumes if you want to. I do think having that information is valuable, but some people are like, it's uh, made up data, it doesn't matter, keyword research is BS, don't do it. And they would prefer a slightly different approach, maybe where you just look at topics or something like that. I think it it's valuable to relatively know if one keyword is searched for 10X compared to the other one. It gives you some idea of what's going on. That said, you may search for some of these, some of the questions that we just found that Google tells us that people are searching for in this valuable information. And it may say like zero search volume. That's okay. You know, people are searching for it and it's a reasonable question. Okay. As we keep going through here, I'm going to answer some questions along the way here. So Sam says, can you comment on hybrid info plus affiliate? Can you be more specific about what you're looking for? So generally, I mean, I, I assume what you're asking about is having a website where you have some affiliate reviews and then you have informational content. And I'm not sure what else to expand on, on all of your content, you can have display ads if you want to. If you, for example, have a very profitable 
piece of affiliate content where you're getting a lot of traffic and you don't want to interfere with conversions or anything and your main goal on that one single page is to convert the affiliate offer, then maybe you don't show ads on it. And with like Ezoic or most of the other ways that you can show ads on your website, you usually can specifically blacklist a page so no ads will show on it so that you could focus on that conversion point. And otherwise, I mean, you know, the sky's the limit. You can publish, you know, mostly affiliate content if you want to. You could post mostly informational content if you want to. And most sites these days are probably, you know, the quote hybrid info and affiliate content. If you have a specific question, just let me know. And a quick side side note here, you'll notice I have, I finally hung the disco ball here. So my friend Carl gave that to the studio. And we actually just recorded an episode for Mile High Fi, which is the t-shirt that I'm wearing or the sweatshirt that I'm wearing here. So now we got the disco ball centered up in between the tables. And I think it's pretty good. I like it. I like it. It's a little, you know, it's directly behind my head now. But, you know, otherwise, it's fine. Okay. So, Daniel says, have a site and looking for keywords for articles. All right, cool. Sounds good. Jason's on. You're looking at the pickling process, foods, and health benefits. And Sam also does ask, just a quick note before we get to that one. I saw your Border Collie video. How's she doing? Should bring her on the show more. Yeah, she she's doing well. She's upstairs right now. She, uh, she gets a little noisy occasionally. Um, and the thing is while I'm doing a live stream, I can't like tend to her much at all. So often it's just amazingly inconvenient to have her down here for a couple of these live streams. I did have a Georgie cam where I put the webcam uh, down low and I would switch cameras and usually she's just sleeping down there, just hanging out. The thing is she wants to play all the time. Yeah. She just wants to play all the time. Okay, so Jason is looking for pickling, the process, the foods, and health benefits. Okay, so let's let's use a, a different mechanism here, a different tool. So one thing before we go too deep is we'll use KW Finder just to quickly look at you know, we, we put in border collies here. And like I said, we didn't even look at search volumes before, but you can see just border collies, 17,000 searches per month. And if we, you know, scroll down, we'll see there's a you know wide range. But again, these are all, these are all kind of general. So one thing you can do with a tool like KW Finder or many others do this, similar to what we were doing manually, you could click on questions and hopefully, again, I didn't test this ahead of time, but hopefully it'll work. And okay, so when do border collies go into heat and we get the search volume. And one of the reasons why I like a tool like KW Finder is you get the SERPs, the search engine result page, the top 10 results are listed here. And then you get this keyword difficulty score and it's very low. So this is one to a hundred. It's not the end all stat, but it does give you an idea of the competition. You could also, you know, find some other keywords that we didn't get into like at all. So here is when do border collies grow long hair? Only 20 searches per month, relatively low competition. And again, we have all of these different results that we could look at. We have the domain authority, page authority, citation and trust flow, the number of links, and the link profile strength, which is a proprietary metric that is calculated by KW Finder. And I think you get the idea. So a tool like this does make it a little bit easier. And you see there are at least 68 questions here. Again, sometimes you got repeats, sometimes it's redundant or the searcher intent is similar to another one. So I would say at least you're probably getting, you know, 
50, 70 percent. It could vary, right? Some of these could be a lot of uh, repeat, but there's a good chance you're going to end up with like 50 keywords. So if you compare what we did before with uh, just the autocomplete and then what we found here, you have enough to get started. You have more keywords than you need, all informational. They're question based. There's a chance one of these could be kind of product related, but I doubt it. So there are so many different little pieces in here that you could dig into. And by the way, quick, you know, we looked at border collies specifically, but what if you focused on herding dogs? So a border collie is a herding dog, but there's a number of other herding type dogs and you focused on that. So it's not the full broad spectrum of all dogs or all pets. You're just looking at a specific herding dog area. You could focus on questions. You could focus on like agility training. And there's all these sort of sub areas that you can get into. Talk about the different phases of life, puppies and middle-aged and elderly dogs as well. So if you start thinking about these things creatively, then you could just start coming up with different ideas. I literally... I had no idea. I was recording a podcast um, until five minutes before we got started. So all I knew is I was going to use a couple tools. And then I thought border collies is something I know a little bit about. So let's shift over to the pickling, uh, pickling process, foods and health benefits. All right. So let's use KW Finder and we'll say like um, something like pick, Pickled, pickling onions. And actually, we'll search here, but we're also going to go back and we're going to search on, we're going to go search, sorry, I didn't share my screen there for a second. We're going to search on Google because I don't know too, too much. So pickling onions. And again, this is a great place to start. Just autocomplete pickling onions and cucumbers in pickle juice, onions versus shallots, red wine vinegar, pearl onions, onions and peppers, balsamic vinegar. Yeah, once you start looking, it's kind of hard because there's too many keywords. So we have quick pickle recipes. So we end up with recipes here. So let's say, let's find the questions here. Why do you soak pickling onions in salt water. What are pickling onions called? Can you do it for too long? How long can you pickle the onions? Two to three weeks. So that's good to know. I actually pickled some onions uh, about three and a half weeks ago, made too many, and I don't know if they're still good. Now the question is, now we're digging into the details. This is what happens. If it's your first time on, we go on tangents sometimes. So when you pickle the onions, I've, I've done this quick pickling stuff, by the way. It's not a true pickling situation. It's not fermented. However, it's in very salty water and there's a lot of vinegar in there too. And that's not a very hospitable place for things to grow. However, one thing that you do put into the quick pickle onions is sugar. So that that could be the the thing that makes you run into an issue. But I did not test the pH. Now we're going real deep here. Thanks, Jason, for asking this. If you test the pH, um, if it's under a certain pH, then you're. it's probably like really hard for anything to grow. And I know that because I am a home brewer and I know about brewing beer and I know once the pH hits a certain level, it's very hard for things to grow in there. Plus it's in the refrigerator. It's not like I'm leaving these pickled onions out on the counter, but man, it's crazy how deep we go sometimes. All right. Can you get botulism from pickled onions? How long do they last? Okay. So we got a lot of pieces in here, a lot of different areas. So pickling onions and questions. So again, we have about 67 of these, which that could be sort of the, the limit generally of what you're going to get. So all these questions and a great place to start. Again, 
you don't have to use a tool like KW Finder, but you can, and it does give you a lot of information. So when you're pickling onions in season, and you can see all these different results and make a determination if it's something that you want to compete with. And this is an interesting one where there's some pretty strong websites with a very high domain authority, a very high link profile strength. But there's also like the, the snippet here is pretty modest. And then there's a site here, the parishfarms.co.uk, which... You know, it has almost no authority, almost no links going to it. So always interesting. If you're just hopping on, thanks a lot. We're looking at informational keywords here. And I'm going to have to hop back and actually look at some of these questions here because we have quite a lot of them. And we didn't get into the process and the health benefits. So maybe we could do like, um, we'll do... Pickled food benefits. So I think this could be a huge area to go deep. Now, we have health benefits here, which could be you know tough to compete with with WebMD. But my hunch is if you go if you go deep on this stuff, you're gonna be all right. And my thought is, right, so we did pickled food benefits, but there's a number of pickled foods. There's like a sauerkraut and kimchi. And I think, I mean, those are both <laughs> fermented cabbage. So th there are many others. Oh yeah, there's a kombucha. I used to make kombucha. And there's all these different sort of pickled um, foods or fermented foods, which I'm lumping in there. Pickling is different than fermenting, but I think there's some crossover. So you can focus on the main topic of pickling and fermented foods, but then dive into all the details of the specific foods that people might be searching for. So again, if you notice what I just did, we started at a pretty broad area and then we got very specific with specific foods Specific questions like how long do quick pickled onions last in your refrigerator? And I have some that apparently are past their prime, unfortunately. I didn't eat them fast enough. But the point is, we went broad, got very specific, extremely very, very specific into the problems in my own refrigerator. And then we're going to come back out and like, oh, here's the idea. It's a site about fermented and pickled foods, and there are probably thousands of keywords if you use techniques like this, if you look at questions, which are perfect to do for informational type websites and keywords. So let's get to some of the questions here. All right. Um, Daniel says, if I have a target keyword like bags border collie that sounds bad if i wrote bags for border collie or border collie bags does that take me away from the target keyword i'm finding a lot of keywords that don't make sense if written in a sentence okay basically you should understand what the person's searching for and then convert it into a phrase it doesn't have to be a sentence but that's exactly the the smart thing that you're looking for you would convert that out of order sentence or phrase into the right order so that it makes sense for a title or if you put it into a sentence or whatever. It doesn't mean that that is not a good keyword. It just means you should put it in the right order so that it makes sense. Google's smart enough to understand the searcher intent and that's what we're aiming for. And... If you have the opportunity, please hit the thumbs up. I really appreciate it if you do. It helps people find the video and it helps my ego get built up. Gabriella says, smartest dogs in the world um, are border collies. Yeah, I think that, okay. And Jason says, Georgie must be listening. Yeah, she's very smart. She's always listening, always watching. 
Okay, and Sater says, please do a case study for info articles related to product reviews like Bluetooth headphones. Okay, I probably won't do a case study on that, but I think you can use some different ideas like we're talking about. So, I mean, what you would, um, what you would do, you know, Bluetooth headphones. So I just type that into Google and, you know, we see that this is a very buyer related keyword, but you could probably dive in like how are, yeah, how harmful are Bluetooth headphones and uh, wireless versus Bluetooth? Is it safe to wear these all day? So you can kind of dive in and look at the questions. Do Bluetooth he headphones cause, cause hair loss? Oh no, I think maybe I found the trigger for my hair loss here because I, I use these Bluetooth headphones, but sadly the hair started coming out long before Bluetooth was common. All right, our uh, Amarsh says that you're new here. Welcome. And I'm going to need to rest my voice in just a second. So I'm going to get through a handful of these questions. I'm going to get through the rest of the questions quickly, and then I'm going to come back after I roll the ad. And it's just a way for me to, you know, rest my, rest my voice here. GTFO, what's up, says, should subheadings as well as text aimed um, at getting the snippets be in bold? Should it be in bold? You know what? I You could do that if you want to. Um, I have a strong suspicion that just because you bold something doesn't help it get into the snippet. And the reason why is it's too fucking easy. If bolding the content helped you get the snippet, then everyone would do it. And then Google would have to find a different way to differentiate. So I would bold for readability, emphasis, the core reasons why you would bold, italicize, or underline a piece of content. All right. Great question here from Sam. If you're relying on a tool like Keyword Finder or KW Finder or any other tool, where does it get its data from? I am not sure. There used to be a data source that you know these companies would purchase and then they would you know, use that in their database. Where do they get it? I'm not sure. If anyone knows, because this is um, a question that I've asked, and I don't think it's easily discovered. I don't, I don't think they're saying like where the data comes from generally, but I could be wrong. I haven't looked in a long time. <laughs> Sam further asks, have I run any tests to verify the data? So this is an interesting one, very data-driven. And from where I sit, um, Number one, I haven't done that. Two, I've never even had the urge. Three, three, is verifying the data is very low value. So go with me on this. Generally, we just want, I mean, the keyword volumes are an estimate, usually based on historical information. So KW Finder, I'm not sure if they get the data from... I'm not sure where they get the data. However, back in the day, we used to use a tool that, you know, Google allowed us to use with the AdWords. It was, you know, the, the keyword research tool for advertisers. And there was a time when you could use that, even if you weren't an advertiser, you can get some great information and understand the keyword volume that Google is telling advertisers. So that was relatively accurate still at just an estimate based on historical data. So the things, you know, the thing is, Sam, if it's accurate or inaccurate, I'm just looking for the general estimate and again, sort of the relative search volume compared to others. So it, it's not exact, it's just an estimate. Now, as far as the keyword difficulty, again, these tools use different algorithms where they, you know, sometimes they look at, the backlink profile, or maybe they're just looking at the specific metrics from other tools, and then they're kind of putting in a couple other parameters in there and then giving a keyword difficulty. Some keywords, it's going to be accurate. Some, it's not going to be accurate. And you could use it to prioritize and sort things, but generally, you know, your decisions shouldn't necessarily be made specifically on the keyword difficulty.
Sam says, what thresholds do you classify as low, middle, high for search volume? For me, it's like uh, very low, like long tail keywords is, you know, roughly 250 searches or less. Sort of the middle range, um, we'll call it like 500 to 2,500 and high is sort of 2,500 to 10,000 and then maybe 10,000 plus is very high. So that's generally a way that you can look at it. Um, Rafat says, what is the best tool to create a topical map in any niche? I don't know. I haven't played with any tool that does a topical map. And I would say, like most things, probably a lot of them are doing similar things. So that could be a little more specific, but I think you could test the tools and I've never used one. That's also to say it's probably not necessary. There's a lot of tools out there that just don't need. And one of the reasons why I just did the autocomplete stuff is a lot of people push back on the keyword research tools and they're like, I don't want to pay any money for anything. <laughs> Which, uh, you know what? I know people are interested in not paying for a tool. So that's why we're looking at it. At some point, a tool can save you some time. But... Uh, the, the point is, like a topical map, I don't think it's 100% necessary. Saeed says, will these fall under uh, your money or your life? So it must be the health benefit thing. So it's on the edge of the health area, which is why we saw WebMD pop up for the pickling benefits. But you, yeah, you potentially are on the edge of it. But I think if you focused on a different area, it probably would be okay. Overall, for the keywords on the site, there may be a couple that are more health-oriented that may be a little tougher. It doesn't mean you shouldn't write content on it, by the way. It just, I mean, if you want to have a complete site and that information would be use, useful, there's no harm in publishing it. Oh, Art says, on your podcast, you talked about virtually unlimited keywords for certain niches. Is this how long do pickled onions last an example of unlimited keywords? Uh, any other examples off the top of your head? So yeah, that, that would be perfect. Yes, Art, insightful and a perfect reason to make sure that you subscribe to the Doug Show podcast. There is a link in the description there's a lot of shows out there. So I suggest, actually, I'm very interested. If a handful of people, if you if you follow the link to the Doug show, you can find whatever player you prefer. You can follow that link. You can search for it on any podcast directory. And I'm curious what might happen if a handful of people, they just download, there's like 350 episodes out there. So if you're like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in, I'm gonna go back to the beginning, I'm going to listen at 3x speed or whatever you can tolerate and just like download all the episodes. I'm curious if we'll see a spike as a result of this live stream where I set it at 48 minutes in. What impact will we have? <laughs> and then I'll report back next week. So you got to tune in next week on May the 10th to let us know. I'll, I'll let y'all know. I'll let y'all know. So you got to tune in and then I'll tell you. So Art, you're 100% right. How long do blank last would be an example? Virtually unlimited. Very interesting take on it. And I'm trying to think of uh, some others. Oh, I got it. I'm very into photography. I have uh, many lenses Soon, I'm going to be going to really like a dark sky area. And I have talked about taking uh, pictures of the stars, astrophotography, and I have a lot of the gear. And it's super nerdy. In high school, I actually got like, I borrowed my mom's film camera. She was always a camera a junkie. And she always wanted to take pictures. It annoyed us, but she always wanted to take pictures. And we're like, ah, mom, we don't want to pose again. Like, ah. But it's so great that she did. And, you know, I, I enjoyed cameras too. So I actually figured out how to take pictures of stars and star trails. And 
there was a bulb setting. The camera people know what I'm talking about. There's a bulb setting on the point and shoot that she had, but you had to hold the button down. Of course, the issue with holding the button down is it would shake. So if you do like a long exposure, you, you would get vibrations and not a clean image. So I figured out what I could do is hold a, a dark piece of cardboard in front of the, the camera. So no light got in there at night. And then I got a thumbtack, put it upside down, and then taped the shutter down and then removed the cardboard. So it took a picture of the stars and then I would leave it open for like a minute or two or maybe 10 minutes or whatever. And then I would put the card back, take the tape off, take the thumbtack off, and I got my picture. So it was a very like manual old school way. Now it's super easy with the cameras we have and like it's practically free because it's a digital camera, you know? So anyway, the point is another unlimited one is how to take a picture of X, how to take a black and white portrait of a puppy, how to take a portrait of an elderly person, how to take a portrait in natural light, how to take a portrait from window light in bright sun, on and on and on, like whatever you're interested in. Let's talk about home brewing, right? Maybe this wouldn't be unlimited, but it's still a shitload of keywords. How do you brew X style? You may have to go to a different, you know, resource like the BJCP style guideline. And then you have, you know, 180 styles. You can look, I can't remember all the sub styles and some of the experimental categories out there. But you could literally have a few hundred articles about just different beer styles. If you wanted to have a YouTube channel, you could sample all those and then put them on your website too and have tasting notes. You also could sample specific beers of that style and go from there. Like the top five Pilsners from the Midwest. Like you can go really deep and that sounds fun. That sounds really fun to do. All right, I'm going to let my voice rest for a second. I know we got a handful of people. I'm going to come back to the questions, but we have an ad from Otis. That's O-D-Y-S. So hopefully we don't lose too many people, but they do sponsor these shows. So give them some love. For today, Otis Global. They're the source for premium age domains with strong branding and powerful backlinks. The feature domain for today is called Hippo Thinks, and it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an odd name, a little bit uh, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's a little cute, I would say, but it was a professional content writing and PR, public relations service. They had a number of different services, including content creation, public relations and media strategy. I did hop over to look it up quickly on the Wayback Machine, and it's been around for a little while here, since 2014, although we didn't see much activity, at least on the Wayback Machine until 2016. The site is eight years old, or the domain is eight years old. The domain rating is nine, a little bit lower than I would have expected given the backlinks of 117 and 63 of those are do follow. The domain authority, however, is about 28, and it's a very brandable name. It doesn't, you know, unfortunately have any sort of keyword uh, in there at all, but it is very brandable from the hippopotamus standpoint, (laughs) of course. I think we should take a quick look at the do follow domain. So we have some pretty amazing links from The Guardian, VentureBeat, Carousel.com, eSchool News, Alley Watch, some others that I don't know what they are, Small Business Advocate, and a bunch of other very impressive domains. So the interesting thing here is with the areas of content creation and agencies, the world that we see and hear about all the time is blowing up. I hear about new agencies all the time. This would be perfect for you to jump into and potentially use this domain for a new service. You could go the B2B route where you white label. One interesting thing, although, oh man, I shouldn't even say it, but 
you could go the route of having an AI content service where maybe you use an AI tool, assuming you know how to use one properly, and then have some editors go over it. Of course, I would advise that you disclose that you're using an AI writer, but some people swear by it and they tell me about it all the time. You could go to the other end of the market, which is where I would recommend. It's usually easier to deal with higher end clients that want high quality service versus, you know, clients that are trying to unfortunately just, you know, pay the cheapest amount no matter what the quality is. That said, you could also sort of shortcut the whole situation and just be an affiliate for services that are out there. Believe me, there are many opportunities. I get pitches constantly where companies want me to be an affiliate for them. If you do get anything from uh, Otis here, you get the logo and there's a little hippopotamus face here which I think is really cute. Again, this uh, domain's eight years old. If you join using my affiliate link over on Otis, you can get $100 in your account, which I greatly appreciate, and I might get a commission if you do buy anything. So thanks a lot to Otis, and let's get back to the show. All right. Luckily, we didn't lose too many people there. And thanks again to all the sponsors. I mentioned Ezoic. We got Otis. We have Niche Website Builders. And you can save uh, some money with niche website builders or get more content. So definitely check that out. And a quick reminder, their Shotgun Skyscraper campaign is going to go up in prices. So if you want to be grandfathered in, I think they are letting that uh, previous pricing, the current pricing stand. You just have a few days for that. I think it's next week where the prices are adjusted. It may be sooner than that. So definitely follow the link and check it out. Let's hit some more questions here and we'll go through whatever we got. All right. Uh, Zaman says, I'm new here. Welcome. Thanks for hopping in and saying hello in the chat. And then we have Char Jeel. Um, you want info keywords from HREF. So we're not doing HREFs today, but the ideas are virtually the same. I think they have the same sort of question capability. So you could hop over there, use their keyword uh, tool section, find the questions, and then you're in good shape. We actually, I know, I think you you joined a little late here, uh, Shar, Jill. Basically, we didn't use much of the tools. We mainly looked at auto suggest and just navigating down to a very specific keyword and then going back up. By doing that, we have identified you know a few areas where there's virtually unlimited keywords. Saeed says that Gail from Authority Hacker mentions that KW Finder and Uber suggest use the same database. Cool. I wouldn't be surprised if most of them do use the same database. And that is, you know, I, I didn't verify that, but Gail is smart, so I, I wouldn't be surprised. Passport King says, you've learned to truly enjoy my dry and honest sense of humor, especially when you admit to being lazy. And yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. So the laziness is somewhat helpful. And I'm not like pure lazy, but there's some stuff where I'm like, I just, I don't want to do that. I think a lot of people can relate to that portion of it, but yeah, part of it is laziness. It's like, you don't want to do the same thing over and over again or anything. All right. Um, someone says writer Zen, uh, Daniel says writer Zen uses, uh, it's data from HREFs and writer Zen. Is it worth it? I don't know. I've never used it. Um, all right. Uh, then GTFO says, is there a way to see search volume without a keyword tool on a Google service? For example. Yeah, I think you can still use, some piece of their advertising tool over there, but I don't think it's extremely usable. I think if you do want to use it, I think you still have to sa sign up as an advertiser and put in credit card info. I don't think you're charged anything, but I think you can get some data. Um, if you are, I would say, you know, you could explore that and you could probably find some YouTube videos or blog posts where people walk you through 
using one of the Google tools for free. The problem is those tools change kind of frequently or at least like over the years. So what might happen is you're going to find like information about the keyword planner from like six years ago and then four years ago and then two years ago and they're all a little out of date. So then you're in a spot where you're like wasting your time. And that's why a lot of times once you're able to use one of the tools, and by the way, most of the tools, you know, Hrefs, KW Finder, Uber Suggest, almost all of them have some free trial for some amount of time. So you could save up your keyword research that you want to do and then sign up, drink a bunch of caffeine, and just do all the keyword research that you can tolerate until your trial's up. And then you'll have an idea if you like using that tool. You can sign up for another tool and do their free trial, do the same situation, and have quite a bit of keyword research done just using a free trial. Sam says, how many hobbies do you have? No wonder you never struggle for content. I have a lot of hobbies. Yeah, a lot of stuff that I'm into. And a lot of things that I'm like, oh, I would like to do more of that. And usually I go, if I find something that I do like, I go fairly deep into it and spend a lot of time on it. And I enjoy the research and all, all the little pieces, all the details. DC says, I'm an astrophotographer too. You'll have a lot of fun. So one thing, and if you're able to answer DC, if you're still, still on, one thing that I think I want to start playing with is the exposure stacking. And for the people that don't know, that's where you take sh shorter, uh, shorter exposures than what you, you maybe ideally would want to take a picture of. And you stack the ex exposures on top of each other. So you end up with like a composite image where you end up with sort of like the the best of the images and you're reducing the bad part of the images. I'm glossing over a lot of details. I think I probably need to use a tool specific for astrophotography to do the image stacking, the exposure stacking. I think you could probably do it in Lightroom or something like that. I don't use any Adobe products and I'm kind of happy about it because I think aren't they all like subscription based right now? So if I'm just casually like, Hey, I want to, I want to edit a few images, but I have to sign up for like whatever 30 bucks a month to pay for software I hardly use. Is that really worth it? Like, do I, do I need to do that? What, what do you use DC for your image, image editing and such? All right. Oh, nice. Uh, Zach has a hypocrite pun. Sam asks about the length of posts for info content and says, for instance, how well would a targeted short post with only a hundred words rank? Probably not that well. I would say, you know, most likely you're probably, you want to aim for recently. I've been hearing from people that do very specific info posts on, we'll say, I'll just say sort of like short topics that you could like answer pretty quickly, like four to 500 words, which is much different than the very long content that we've heard about for a while. But one thing you can do is answer quickly and then pepper in some of those related frequently asked questions, as I mentioned before. And those are probably going to help quite a bit to lengthen it. And I would say if you can hit you know, 800 words, that's probably pretty good. But the main thing is make it as long as it needs to be. Look at the competitors out there. Look at how long that content is. And you'll have a much better idea of what you can try and what to get away with. And sometimes, you know what, if it's a very quick answer, 100 words, maybe that covers it. Maybe you should elaborate a little bit. But if it only needs to be 100 words, and a lot of the other content is around that same length, then just do that. All right. Uh, and Adrian is, you're kind of late. And I bet if 
Alex is going live today. I bet he's probably on. Isaac asks, what's up, Isaac? Isaac was recently on the show here. Thanks for the live stream. How much would you pay a writer on Upwork for an article for a keyword that you found on Google according to the KW planner has a zero monthly search volume, assuming a thousand words? Probably, so your payment method shouldn't be, or your payment amount shouldn't be based on the search volume. If you're getting a thousand words, then, you know, you got to figure out how much your budget is and who you want to hire. For me, for a thousand words, I'd probably pay somewhere between like, I'll say like 18 on the low end to say like 50 bucks, depending on the topic and that sort of thing. The, there's a couple flaws, right? So number one, if you're paying someone based on the search volume, then they may be doing a lot of work and you know a thousand words and you're like well it gets a search volume of zero and even though they're doing work you're valuing whatever they're doing lower than it should be maybe they'd be like ah well i'm not going to write the content that pays a very low amount if it's the same amount of work for the writer then why would they the other piece that is flawed and maybe more important is Just because the keyword planner or a search tool says that it's a zero search volume, it doesn't mean people aren't searching for it. In fact, we hear a lot of stories and uh, longtime viewers will know that many times the top keyword for someone or the top post for someone is targeting a keyword that gets zero search volume. So they're, they're getting more traffic on that post than any other post on their site. And they thought it was a zero search volume keyword. This is puzzling for many people. The reason why is they're probably ranking for a lot of long tail keywords that are related, that also have a zero search volume and no one's going after them. And maybe there's a lot of different variations of how someone will search for it. So there's all these different forms of the search phrase, but the searcher intent is the same. So they end up with a lot of traffic on a post that they thought wasn't really going to be much. They were like, "Ah, I'll try it. Who knows? And then it ranks for all these other long tail keywords that they didn't even consider. So that's what happens. DC has given me some information. So the best way to do it, uh, stack images using 10 to 60 seconds. It gives better results than a five minute exposure with star trails. Cool. There are free tools to stack. Deep Sky Stacker is best than stack photo and Photoshop to bring the colors. Okay, I need to write that down. So that is Deep Sky Stacker. And do you have a star tracker? Do you use one of those? I haven't explored it. Um, or know how much they cost at all, but that makes sense to me. And I think I'm going to be doing like pretty wide angle stuff, constellation kind of stuff, or obviously for the exposure and, you know, this, um, coming up, you know, when I'm going out to this dark sky area, I'll probably be using my 14, uh, F 2.8 on a full frame. So it should be very wide And yeah, I'll probably do, I'm probably going to aim for, yeah, 15 second exposures or something like that and see how it goes. So thanks for the info there. Um, Hobby says, trucker check-in, is it informational or educational keywords? I don't know. I'm not sure probably informational and I'm assuming you're saying like informational and educational are the same I think that's like a definition type thing but I'm not I'm not 100% sure what you're asking about so DC is giving me more okay I'm interested in this so DC we're talking about astrophotography here we're going deep and we're, we're gonna lose everyone here but this is for me 
So I took 130 second um, subs. What does subs mean? 130 second images, I, I guess, of Andromeda Galaxy and you stacked them all using Deep Sky Stacker and enhanced the output in Photoshop and they came out really well. I use a go-to mount to track the stars. Okay, go-to mount. What does that run? How much does it go to? Okay, $300, perfect for a DSLR. Perfect. So AZ GTI, great entry level. Okay, GTI, great entry tracking mount. Got it. Okay, very cool. And the thing is, like, I'm actually, so I'm in Longmont, and, you know, it's relatively close to Denver. Boulder's bright. I mean, Longmont is bright as well. But there are, you know, I could drive like, I think like, well, if I get into Rocky Mountain National Park or the vicinity, it is very dark there and, you know, pretty amazing. And it's only, you know, 45 minutes away to get into the park in that vicinity. And it's very dark there. And alternatively, right, as opposed to John, who is in Ohio, um, it is, it's clear all the time. It's actually cloudy today. We got a little rain yesterday and hopefully we'll get a little more today, but Colorado boasts, you know, 300 sunny days a year. And I mean, it's, it's clear all the time. We're up at 5,000 feet or so and it's, you know, it's clear all the time. And when I'm going to be out in the dark sky area, we're going to be kind of in the middle of nowhere in uh, New Mexico. And I mean, I think the closest city is going to be Santa Fe and that's going to be like hour and a half away, something like that. So we're like fucking middle of nowhere, basically. So in quick example, like again, if you have hobbies, as someone mentioned here, I have a lot of hobbies, a lot of things I'm interested in, things I want to check out and try. And you can go so deep into this stuff. So just thinking of the astrophotography area, there are software, there are you know different apps you can use on your phone for uh, you know visualizing and mapping out the sky as opposed to like the books that I had when I was younger. There's cameras, there's camera lenses, there's tripods, there's these star trackers. There's all this um, just random shit people don't even know exists. And there's like a whole subculture of people that are, um, you know, they're going out to like dark sky areas and hanging out. There's clubs, newsletters, all this random stuff for many different things. It'll be for like pickling too. We took Georgie to a... Uh, frisbee dog competition back in bozeman they're into stuff too it's cra- like if find a hobby that people are into and there's like unlimited keywords it's insane john says great question here on the topic of photography how do i feel about geographic information posts such as instagrammable places in houston or best parks in ohio that's cool that sounds great i haven't explored those but I think those are those are the kind of keywords, again, where it's pretty much unlimited. Best parks in Ohio. And then, obviously, you could fill in subregions of Ohio. You can talk about different states. You can say best parks in Ohio for dog owners, best parks in Ohio for families and children. And then, again, all of a sudden, you end up with basically more key you're going to have more of an issue figuring out how to organize the content on the site than finding more keywords instagrammable places in fill in the city any city over a hundred thousand people pretty simple so again like once you start diving in you think about this in a certain way you're not going to run out of keywords you're going to have too many keywords you'll have other problems And Daniel says, too much light pollution to see anything in the sky in London. Yeah. Um, Oh, and uh, Couch says, your husband is rafting the Rio Chama. Chama. I don't know how to say it. Michael is on as well. What's going on? Is uh, Alex live right now? 
as Alex doing his live stream. We did lose a couple people at the bottom of the hour here. I do have to jet shortly. We've gone a little bit long, but I'll mention, uh, you know, definitely please check out the sponsors. Let them know that you appreciate them. It'll help these, you know, keep going. So very important. Even, you know, one one tip that um, that I gave people is, uh, you know, a lot of times people do social media and stuff when they're sitting on the toilet. So that, that is a great time to shoot an email over to Mark and Adam, Niche Website Builders, or Otis. You know, hop over there, figure out how to message them, find their email, and just say thanks for supporting Doug's show. Yeah, that's a good time to do it. You got a, you got a few minutes. You're sitting there trying to figure out what to do, and. Um, Oh yeah, and uh, Couch says uh, sadly there's fires near Santa Fe right now and Las Vegas, or yeah, I think maybe Las Vegas, New Mexico. Yeah, we were looking at that. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know. I didn't realize you know they had some active fires going on, but they do. I think you know fortunately we'll be okay. But yeah, the fires are very scary around here. We have a go bag now. All right, Michael has a question. We'll sort of wrap it up here. And Daniel says that. Alex is live right now, so I will uh, I'll play out. I, I, I will play guitar for a minute here. Michael says, what different ways are there to monetize informational keywords? So the easiest way is display ads. So you can do that. You can work directly with companies as well. That can be helpful. If it's a house, so here's one thing that we didn't talk about. Let's say you want to have some affiliate monetization on an informational post. If you're able to tell the visitor a way to do something easier or cheaper or faster, then you should recommend the product because that's helpful for someone trying to figure out how to do something. And to tie it in to exactly what we're talking about here, I was asking, you know, how do you stack images? Like, what do you do? And here, here's the keyword, how to stack exposures for astrophotography. You can go through a step-by-step -step method. Maybe you can show me how to do it with some free tools. Maybe the one that we talked about here, the deep, deep sky stacker, for example, you can explain how to do it with a free tool. There's a chance it's easier or faster to use a paid tool and you can recommend that tool. So you can monetize informational posts with affiliate offers. And the other way is you, you know, you could straight up put, you know, just affiliate links in there. And those are the main ways. There's only a few ways to monetize stuff. You can sell a informational product if you want to, that goes a little bit deeper, but essentially that's promoting some product. So either display ads or recommend a product. The display ads are the easiest way to do it. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up here. I need to have uh, some quick lunch. And I think we're... <laughs> okay, Hobby says, how to check offline topic info, information, informational keywords from offline database. I don't know what you're talking about here. I don't know offline databases. I mean... It would just be like searching databases, but I don't know what an offline database is. All right, so be sure to support the sponsors. Definitely check out the Doug Show podcast. And I have another podcast called Mile High Fi. We talk about personal finance. And honestly, if you're interested in earning money online, like extra money, there's a good chance you should probably be interested in personal finance topics as well. So I think this should work. And for the new people, I sometimes, I'm now just doing whatever I want. <laughs> so we're gonna pull out the guitar and I just play for like a minute. And uh, I've been taking lessons. I got a lesson later today. And this guitar just sounds awesome. 
This is my 1939 Recording King, Carson Robinson. I, I'm not sure if I'm ready to play some of the most recent stuff that I learned, but I'll, I'll try here. Just if it sounds good. I didn't warm up either. It's been a busy morning. We'll just leave it at that for today.